Thank you. Praise the Lord. We have many inspiring preachers in the house. I welcome everyone and I pray that this time together, today, tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday will be an unforgettable time in everyone with everyone in Jesus name. I pray God will give every one of us the grace to be present all over through the weekend so that everything the Lord wants to impart into every life you will not miss, I will not miss, none of us will miss in Jesus name. <laughs> Father, we thank you. We know this is your plan to be in this place at this time for this purpose and to know that you have called us to the greatest thing we can do on earth and that you will impart all that we need into our lives so that we can excel in ministry even in these troublous times oh lord i pray you fulfill in jesus name lord our lives will not be wasted our time will not be wasted your resources in our lives will not be wasted use everyone to the highest maximum level you have ordained to be in every life in every minister every ministry in jesus name we thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray god bless you you can sit down tonight we're considering the message a divine call to the highest service a divine call for the highest service. If you think about yourself and what you're doing and what the Lord has called you to, you need to understand that this is the best and the highest and the greatest you could do in life. God knew that. He knows what you could be. He knows where you could stretch your hand and stretch your skill, but... He has given you a divine call. And he has said, any other thing you could do, this is the very highest in your life. And I pray that God himself will reveal to you in a revelation that will be indelible that you are in a strategic place at a strategic time and in a strategic generation. A divine call to the highest service. We're looking at the book of Jonah and I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. The book of Jonah, reading from chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. The word of the Lord, that means the might of God. The message for the hour, the message for the time, and the message and revelation that will be fulfilled in his life and will catapult him and push him to the highest thing he could do in his life. Of course, Jonah did not know that. But as we look at the story, you will find that this is the best and the greatest that could have happened to Jonah at that time. And as you look at your life, you will find that where you are, what you're doing, the calling of God in your life is the very best and the greatest that could ever happen in your life. Look at verse 2. This is the word of the Lord to him. Arise, go to Nineveh. Arise, go to Nineveh. The Lord was very specific and very definite as to where he would go. Of course, there were thousands of others the Lord could have called. The Lord could have called this man or that woman, this man or that other individual, but he centered on Jonah. The Lord could have called any other person but you, but he decided that you are the man. He decided you are the woman that he was sent to do a particular thing. What no other person could do at your time or in Jonah's time arise go to Nineveh that great city and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me 
He didn't send an angel. He sent Jonah. He didn't send any other personality or those who have led, like Moses, like Joshua, like Caleb, who were already in heaven. He could have sent them back, but he did not. But he pointed out Jonah. He could have sent an angel. What you are doing now, what you, uh, what you are doing in ministry, but he called you. And I pray that you will not fail in ministry. You will not disappoint heaven in ministry in Jesus' name. Now we're dividing the message to three parts. I'm looking at number one, the purposeful revelation of the great commission. Number two is the perishable rejection and the great condemnation. Number three, the profitable response with great consecration. Look at number one there, the purpose of the, rep, the purposeful revelation of the great commission. For Jonah, it was his great commission that the Lord had called him to. Look at chapter, chapter 1 again of Jonah chapter 1, reading from verse 1 now. Now, at this time, whatever he had done in the past, forget about that. Whatever will happen in the future, forget about that. Now at this time, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying in verse 2, it says, arise. Don't sit down, arise. Don't just stay in one place, arise. Don't be too satisfied with what you've done in the past. Where you've been in the past, how you have run errands for the Lord in the past. Arise. Don't look around and say, I think what all I've done and what where I've gone and what the results I got and what the privilege I've had in the past. I think it's time for me now to retire. It's time for me to relax. It's time for me to take some time off. It says, Arise. There is an urgent work to do. Go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was very far from where Jonah was, and yet the Lord said, Go to that Nineveh. And God said that great city. He knew how great the city was in size. He knew great in population, great in the many people that were there go against that and cry against it and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me. That was the great commission for Jonah. And we have the great commission to the cities where the Lord has sent us to. The cities and the people who are there that the Lord has sent us to it says arise and go there. And it's a great city. Cry against it for their wickedness has come before me. Look at this great commission that is purposeful. This revelation that is purposeful. And this is that is purposeful, this calling on the life of Jonah, very purposeful. Look at three things there. We're looking at number one, the imperative call to the great city. We have many great cities in our land, and many great cities in our country, many great cities in our continent, Africa, and the Lord is calling the minister, the minister for this and the minister for that, the preacher and the prophet of God, it says this is an imperative call. There's no other thing important now for Jonah, no other place important for Jonah, no other assignment important for Jonah. That great city go there imperative, the imperative call to the great city. Number two, the irreplaceable command to the great commission. Jonah couldn't have said, God, tell me another thing to do. Jonah, there's no other thing. Tell me another place to go. There's no other place. Give me another assignment. There's no other assignment. This is irreplaceable. Have you looked at your life? You're doing something now. I wish I would do another thing. No, this is what to do. And this is the place to go. And it is irreplaceable. The irreplaceable command for, to the great commission. Number three, the irresistible conviction with great consecration. The calling is irresistible. If you try to dodge it, if you try to run away from it, you'll find that God is still saying that 
is what to do. That is the place to go. I have no other assignment for you. This is what to do. The irresistible conviction with great consecration. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the imperative call to the great city. It tells us in uh, Luke chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 42. Luke chapter 4, we're looking at verse 42, and when it was day, he departed, that's talking about Jesus Christ, and went into a desert place, and the people sought him, and came unto him, and stayed him, and stopped him, and got his attention, that he should not depart from them. The people came to Christ. It's what is done miracles. It saved many souls. Many people have been forgiven and they were rejoicing of the great impact of the, of the ministry of Christ and they stopped him and they stayed him and they said abide here with us. Don't go any other place. Look at verse 43. In verse 43 he said unto them I must preach the kingdom of God into other cities also. Look at that. To other cities also. Have you thought about the cities? Are you satisfied with where you are and what you're doing or what you have done and the Lord is saying, look at that city in heaven. Look at that city. I mention the name of that city to you in your state, in your country, or in any other place. The Lord Jesus said, I must, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. For therefore am I saved. You want to underline that in your Bible. Is there anything you can point to? And you will say, because of this, I was saved to this world. Because of this, I was saved to this generation. Because of this, I was saved at this time, at this perilous time, at this troublous time, at this time when things are tough and difficult, in this place I am now, I know therefore am I a saint. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Not only really one place, they went from place to place until they covered those cities. We're told in Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 4, Acts 8 verse 4, it says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. The one assignment, the number one job, the indispensable thing we have to do. The imperative call in our lives to the great cities preaching the word. The word of his grace. Preaching the word. The word of salvation. Preaching the word. The word of redemption. Preaching the word. The word of transformation that will transform their lives. Preaching the word. And we're told as many people went in different places preaching the word. We're told in verse 5 it says then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. Everybody has a share. Everybody has his calling. To the city of Samaria, Philip went and preached Christ unto them. Look at verse 25. In verse 25 it says, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages, of the Samaritans kept on preaching a city preach there a town preach there a village preach there everywhere you go and you see people and meet people preach the word the word of life the word of eternal life look at verse 40 in verse 40 it says but Philip was found in Azotus and passing through he preached in all the cities he preached in all the cities. These were people that understood the calling of God in their lives. They understood the imperative call that the Lord had given them to the great cities of the world till they came to Caesarea. We're looking at number two there. Number two, we're looking at the irreplaceable command 
to the great commission. The great commission has been given to us and we cannot replace it by another sin. We cannot say, God, I'm busy doing this, I'm busy doing that because of that. I cannot go to Nineveh because of that. I cannot go to the cities that you have called me to. The irreplaceable command to the great commission. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 58. I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 58 verse 1 cry aloud spare not lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins here God called Isaiah and he told Isaiah he said you responded to the call when I said who will go for me or who will go for us you said here am I send me all right you are there now in the right place at the right time for the people I want you to I want you to speak to but don't keep quiet cry aloud spare not lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins are we doing what he has called us to do? Are we doing what he expects us to do? Yes, maybe we have gone. Maybe we have gone to our Nineveh. Maybe we have gone to that city. Maybe we have gone to that community. Are we lifting up our voices? Are we crying aloud? Or are we sparing them? Are we telling them what the Lord has told us to tell them in Ezekiel chapter 3? Ezekiel chapter 3, a medium from verse 17. It says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. Whatever others are made to do you Ezekiel I made you a watchman whatever your colleagues are doing whatever your schoolmates are doing and whatever the people you went to college together training together seminary together whatever they're doing whatever the business they're carrying on the Lord is talking directly to you let others do what they believe they should be doing but you I have made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. God was very clear, was very definite to Ezekiel. Whatever Jeremiah is doing, whatever Isaiah is doing, and whatever Daniel may be doing, here is your calling. Irreplaceable. Find out and check up what has he called you to do and concentrate on that so that he will reward you for what you're doing because you did what he called you to do. He said, therefore, hear the word at my mouth. Now, don't draw on ahead without hearing the word from him. Yeah, Jonah had the word, revelation. Ezekiel had the word, revelation. And I say at the word, revelation, and you are to hear the word from his mouth and give them warning from me. Not from your mind, not from your opinion, not from your ideas, not from what I think, as you tell them in this peculiar time, give them the warning from me. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning. You're too gentle to warn anyone. You're too gentle to tell a sinner that the way he is following is a hard way. It's a sinful way. It's a way that will lead to perdition. No, you cannot say that. For you, it's a forbidden word forbidding attitude that you are so tender you cannot tell somebody who is perishing and who is going the way of destruction you don't have the courage you don't have the mind you don't have the backbone to tell him to tell her this is the way of perdition well it says when i say 
when God says, when the Almighty says that unto the wicked thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to one the wicked from his wicked way. You, you know, you know, people say, uh, people this period of time, uh, they are so much on edge. They have hypertension, and they have all this uh, blood pressure. I don't want to tell them uh, anything that will judge them, anything that will offend them, anything that will raise their blood pressure. Yes, I know the fellow is destroying himself. The fellow is destroying herself. I know what she's doing, uh, and I know if she dies in that condition, I hope not. I hope she doesn't die. If she dies in that condition, from the revelation of the word of God, this man will perish. This woman will perish, but I'll wait for the right time. I cannot tell him now because of his condition. This is exactly the time to tell him so he can repent. And when he repents, the Lord will turn his life, turn everything around because God said that if you don't want him, if you are not able to sum up the courage and fulfill your ministry and tell him, it says that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood well, I require at your hand. Are you surprised well, that a house is burning and you are there? You have the skill, you have the knowledge, you have the ability to get in there and rescue that man, bring him out. But you are there, you hear the cry, you hear the screaming, and you hear the people are burning and you could rescue them. But you just stand there, wouldn't even your neighbors, even the people around, would they not say you are a murderer? Would not, they not require his blood at your hand? Of course, that's what the Lord is saying. You see a man perishing, but you respect him so much, you cannot tell him the truth that will save his life. He says he'll perish because the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But his blood will I require at your hand. Then in verse 19, he tells us in verse 19, Yet if thou want the wicked, and he turned not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. There are people that have the idea, they say, you know, preacher, the people of these days, they are hard-hearted. They are hard -hearted. Even if I try to tell him, I know he will not hear. I, I know it's not going to answer. So what's the point? I just waste my time. I waste my breath. And I waste my, you know, precious skill on that person. That's what Jonah could have thought about Nineveh. Nineveh was so hard, was so bad, so wicked, and so inhuman that he would have thought there's no point going there. And it's even dangerous for me. Me alone going to Nineveh, those people, they're not predictable. That's why he ran away. And that's why many of us sometimes today were saying, going to that area, no, they will not listen. I know they will not listen. And then we can go back to history. So and so went there and he came back empty handed. Nothing happened. So and so went there. Nothing happened. If the Lord has sent you, the Lord who has sent you will back you up. The power of the Lord and the unction of the Lord will go with you. They will listen to you in Jesus' name so that their blood will not be required at you. And look at Matthew chapter, chapter 28. We're reading from verse 18. Matthew 28 verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He's sending the whole church with the whole world 
to the whole world, not just Peter alone, to teach all the nations, and not John or James to teach all the nations. It's every one of us. If the whole church will get up and you do your part, I do my part, he does his part, and she does her part, in no time at all, we'll get the work done. But we need to have the same vision. We need to have the same mission. We need to have the same passion. We need to have the same fire. We need to have the same consecration. We need to have the same penetrating skill that will penetrate the hearts of the people. If you have the fire I have, if he has the fire she has, if he has the, uh, the passion she has, if every one of us together we have the fire, the power, the passion of heaven in our lives, then as a church together, as a body of ministers together, you go there, I go there, she goes there, she goes the other place, then we'll be preaching the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then in verse 20, it says, teaching them to observe all things, all things. When we, when you are going to the battlefield, don't leave part of the weapon behind. When you're going to, if you're going to be a warrior, and if you're going to do what the Lord has called you to do, all the weapons He has given you, all the things He has given you, take everything there. Don't leave part of the word, and don't leave part of the message behind. Teaching them to observe all things what. So ever I have commanded you and lo, I am with you always. It will be with you. I said it will be with you. God is no respecter of persons. He told Joshua, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. And then for Elisha, as he was with Elijah, he was with Elisha. For Paul, as he was with Paul, he was with Timothy. He'll be with every one of us. Everywhere you go, everywhere you share the word, everywhere you preach the word, the presence, the power, the anointing, the unction of the spirit were bound in your life life in Jesus name and he says and lo I am with you always even unto the end of the world not only the first generation of believers of preachers of apostles of ministers unto the end of the world is still with us today it will ever be with us in Jesus name we come to number three here number three is the irresistible conviction with great consecration the great commission cannot be fulfilled without the great consecration if there's a great work to do we need great resources and we need great quality of time and we need great determination if the assignment is great the people who are to fulfill that great assignment they should have the great skill that will go along with that the Lord has given us great the great commission and to carry that great commission out we must have a great consecration. In Micah chapter 3, looking at verse 8. Micah chapter 3, we're looking at verse 8. It says, but truly, I am full of power. I am full of power. The power is available because Jesus himself said, he shall receive power, not trickle power. Not a power that is barely known and barely felt and barely seen. He said, it shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then he says, when that power comes, the fullness of power, he says, will witness for him in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria. And then he says, unto the uttermost part of the earth. And Micah comes to say that it is no different than you are, than I am. The same power that resided in him can reside in you. And we can tarry, and we can pray, and we can seek the Lord until what he did for Micah to fulfill the ministry God gave him, he'll do for you, do for me, will fulfill our ministry. 
you will fulfill your ministry. It says, but I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. By the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment, of justice, and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. We're coming to point number two here. We're coming to Jonah chapter one and we're looking at verse three. Jonah chapter one, we're looking at verse three. It says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. Think about that. From the presence of the Lord. It's like somebody running away from air. Then he will die. Because air is everywhere. And you cannot run away from air. If you run away from air, it means that you want to kill yourself. The presence of God is everywhere. Where will we not find God? Where can I run to? Any corner there? Any height there? Any valley there? Any mountain there? Any forest there? Any bush there? Any kind of, you know, secret house there? You can run to from the presence of God. He is everywhere. That's why we say God is omnipresent. Present everywhere. Omniscient, knowing everything. And he is uh, omnipotent, he has all power. Present everywhere, knowing all things and powerful. Powerful to do everything. But Jonah, a prophet who should know the mind of God, who should know the attributes of God, who should know the personality of God, who should know the impossibility of running away from the presence of God, he did it all the same. There are many times we know some good things and in our humanness, in our foolishness, in our deliberate ignorance, we still attend to do that we know cannot be done, undoable. It says, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a sheep going to Tashish. So he paid the fear uh, thereof and went down into it and uh, to go with them unto Tashish from the presence of the Lord. Now you'll see that when somebody is running away from the will of God, from the revelation of God, Satan is always at hand to provide the ship, the boat, the transportation that will take him there. When anybody knows the mind of God and the will of God and you say, no, I'm not going to do that, if almost all doors will open in the opposite direction and the fellow will say, you, you see now, look at that door opening and look at the boat available and look at the sailors available and look, and I have the right amount to pay and I'm paying this and it looks like, uh, you know, I'm going to have my way. No, you have not had your way. The beginning of the journey does not tell the whole story. What happens as you go along again Against the revelation of God, against the calling of God, against the will of God, that is what matters as everything unfolds. We're looking at verse 4. In verse 4, we are told, But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the sheep was like to be broken. We're coming to this point now is the perishable rejection and the great condemnation. When somebody rebels against the known will of God, when somebody rebels against the known calling of God, when somebody knows in, the, in his heart of hearts, this is the way to go. This is the thing to do. This is the calling of God. And he or she deliberately leaves that will of God and then he follows self-will. And that self-will becomes Satan's will. When we forsake 
the will of God, God Almighty, the will of our Savior, the will of the mighty sovereign of heaven. And then we follow a will that is self-will. And that self-will becomes Satan's will. And when God calls us to something and then we forsake that thing and we join hands with the devil. And we join a heart, a mind of the devil to go the opposite direction. God will fight against that when his servant goes to make friends with Satan, to twat, to oppose, to run against the will of the Almighty God. Three things we're looking at very quickly here. Number one, the stage and the self-centeredness of carnal servants. A servant, carnal. A person that had the voice of God, yet carnal. The stage, the state of mind, the stage of spirituality, the state and the self-centeredness of carnal servants. Number two, the storm and the suffering from the compassionate shepherd. If you have heard or learned about shepherds before, sometimes when a sheep is going astray, they send the dog after after the sheep. Well, the sheep might bite the dog might bite the sheep, but it's the compassion of the shepherd to bring that sheep that is going astray to bring it back to the care and the umbrella and the protection and the security of the shepherd the storm and the suffering of from the compassionate shepherd number three the sleep and the stupefaction of a careless soul let's look at number one there number one there we're looking at the stage and the self-centeredness of carnal servants. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, we've read that already. You see, he ran away from the Lord. His state of mind was the state of the mind of a backslider, the state of mind of a rebel, and the state of mind of somebody who is fighting against God and fighting against the will of God. In Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 6. Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 6. It says, for to be carnally minded is death. Look at Jonah. Jonah in that ship, then with all those sailors, with the psalm, the suffering, and they taking everything they have, throwing everything into the sea, throwing their food away so as to lighten the ship, and the storm continued against them, and they tried and tried, and their lives were in danger because of one canal servant inside that boat. And there are times you take all your resources and um, you put it into business, and there is uh, then you join with a carnal servant. That person knows the will of God. He knows that business is not what God has called him to. The Lord has called him to the, go to that great city. And he's running away from going to that great city. And he says he's looking for business partners. We'll sell this, we'll sell this, and sell that. And lo and behold, there's a great storm because of the carnal servant that is there. Sometimes uh, you accommodate a carnal servant is uh, running from the Lord and he said, uh, can I have that accommodation with you there? Can you hide me there? And you didn't ask, where are you coming from? What are you supposed to do? Where should you be now? Were you a minister? And what are you running away from? You didn't ask any question and then like that Colonel Jonah came into your boat and just discover problem here, problem here, problem here and because you didn't pray to ask the Lord, oh Lord, why this? Why that? And you continue keeping that canal journal there. Troubles continue. And sometimes, as a canal person is a backslider, he's got his wife in another place. And then he comes, he says, you know, I can, I, can we join our hands together in marriage? And you don't
don't know the man is turning away from the will of God and from the choice of already married and they were married in the you know registry or church or whatever and it's now he wants to join your boat and say well I'm available you are available for trouble why didn't you pray and check up because there is the self-centeredness and there is the selfishness and there is the carnality and there is the evil that a carnal man, a carnal woman, a carnal servant will carry everywhere he goes and everywhere she goes. He tells us there to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It says in verse 7, look at verse 7 there, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. If you never, if you didn't know any carnal person before, here is one. It's a Jonah. And this Jonah was fighting against God at enmity with God. God said up, he said down. God said, go to Nineveh. He said, no, I'm going to Tashish. And God says, this is the place to go and minister. And he rebels and he rejects. And he says, no, I will not. That's a carnal mind. Anyone that knows the mind of God and he says no to that, that's carnal. Anyone that knows the direction of the scriptures and he says, no, I'm not going to do that, that's carnal. Anyone that knows the will of God, that this is the will of God to follow, and he rejects and he receives, and he persists in the rejection and resistance against the will of God. That's the carnal man right there, that's the carnal woman right there, that's the carnal mind right there, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject, it is not submissive to the law of God, neither in Indeed, can be. And then he tells us in verse 8 So then, they that are in the flesh, controlled by the flesh, what they feel, what they see, what they sense, and they always see danger ahead of them. God calls them to Nineveh, they always see danger there. He calls them to another great city. They always see danger there. Cause them to another assignment. They always see danger there. They never see that God will help them. That God will support them. That God will go before them. That underneath them are the everlasting arms. And they always see a problem, problem, problem. Where the promises of God would have led them. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. In the state that Jonah was, he wasn't pleasing God. And when you are carnal, when you are opposed to God, when you are against the will of God, when you are against the revelation of God in your life, you will not be pleasing God. The place of self-centeredness is a place that does not please God. We're looking at number two there. Number two there is the storm and the suffering from the compassionate shepherd. Look at Jonah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 4 there. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 4, and the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. Uh, you know, there are people that always attribute everything that happens to God. There are other people that attribute everything that happens to Satan. Now, for the child of God, if you're in the center of the will of God, we know the will of God is the promise of God. The will of God is to take care of his own children when that child is in the center of the will and the revelation of God for him or her. But when the just, the justified, the child of God, the saved, converted person, when the just becomes a Jonah, when the justified becomes a Jonah, when the person that had known and tasted of the grace of God, and I've been walking with God, I've been moving with God, and he knows the word, he knows the revelation, when he turns away and becomes a Jonah, rebellious, and also resisting the will of God. When things happen, it should not just uh, glibly say, it is Satan, it is Satan. Uh -uh. Come and look at this. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 4, But the Lord sent out 
a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. We were told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, reading there from verse 32. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 32. But when they are judged, when we are judged, now Paul the apostle was of course a believer and he's talking about believers now. He's talking to believers in uh, at Corinth and he said Corinthians look at what is happening many are sick and many are even dying and many sleep and he said you know what God is doing there's something he's trying to correct and when he, he said that he said when we are judged we're just in the of the Lord, not of Satan. We're against the will of God. We're walking against the will of God. We're living against the word of God. We're rebelling against the revelation of the Lord. And he says, chastisement will come. And he says, when we're chastised like that, it is so that we should not be condemned with the world. It is so that that suffering will make us think. That suffering will convict us. That suffering will make us repent. That suffering will make us turn around. And then we'll seek the face of the Lord in real practical confession and repentance and as we turn then the mercy of God will come in Psalm 119 Psalm 119 he tells us in verse uh, reading there from verse 6 to 7 in verse 6 to 7 he said before I was afflicted I went astray when I, when I was you know healthy and normal and everything was all right I went astray. I forgot myself. I took the grace of God for granted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, after that affliction, after that suffering, after that rebuke, after that correction, after that chastisement, but now I have kept thy word. The chastisement, the suffering brought him back. Just like he did for Jonah. Look at verse 71. In verse 71 it says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. It is good for me. I look back now and I see. If the Lord allowed, allowed me to go on in my self-will, in my carnality, in my rebellion, in my disobedience, and everything was still working well, I would not have returned unto the Lord. And it says, it is good for me. It is good for my soul. It is good for my future. It is good for me because it will help me to get to heaven. It is good that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes, that I might learn thy statutes. It tells us in 1 verse 176, in the last verse of that Psalm 119, it says, I have gone astray. I have gone astray. Like a lost sheep, seek thy servant. And sometimes when he seeks that servant, canal, that servant sinful, that servant rebellious, that servant backsliding, he seeks him on the road. He seeks him with chastisement. He seeks him with a mighty tempest on the ocean of his life. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Number three, here we're looking at number three in number three it says the sleep and the stupefaction of a careless so in Jonah chapter one we're looking at verse five then the mariners were afraid because of the storm and because of the raging waves they were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten each of them but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the sheep and he lay and was fast asleep Jonah fast asleep look at verse 6 in verse 6 it says so the sheep master came to him and said unto him what meanest thou 
What are you doing here? Oh sleeper, arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will seek upon us that we perish not. He was asleep. You remember those who just sleep off? They don't want to remember any bad thing they have done. And so they might go to sleep on a drink. They might say, I'll drink myself to sleep. My friend, that doesn't stop the trouble. You've gone somewhere. You've done something wrong. And conscience is whipping you. And conscience is striking blows upon you. Conscience is pinching you and piercing you with guilt and condemnation. And then some people say, I, I know to get rid of that. Maybe they'll smoke. I know if I smoke that thing, smoke that thing, then my brain will turn around. I'll forget that. I'll be able to get some sleep. I'll be able to relax. That doesn't take away the problem. Jonah was asleep and the storm continued. They would have drowned and the shipmaster came and said sleeper, what are you doing here? The sin made him, allow me to use the word, is the real word, stupid. He didn't have any sense anymore. Life was in danger. Now, Jonah, you're a prophet. Jonah, you're a preacher. Jonah, you're a person that had received revelation of what Jonah tell me. If you died fighting against God, where will you spend eternity? Uh -uh. He was blind. He was dead and was dumb and was sleeping. Jonah, if you died in this condition, all the good things you had done in your life, according to the story that we read about him in Second Kings chapter 14, 20, verse 25, if you died in this condition, where will be the reward of everything you've done in the past? Jonah couldn't think about that. The soul was sleeping, and the sleeping of the soul and the sleeping of the spirit brings the sleeping of the body. When the soul is sleeping, and when the spirit is sleeping, the brain will be asleep, and that is a dangerous situation. Look at Proverbs chapter 23, and I'm reading there from verse 34. Proverbs chapter 23 verse 24 Yea, they shall be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea and as he that lieth upon the top of a mast in verse 35 they have stricken me shall thou say and I was not sick they have beaten me and I felt it not they shall when shall I awake I will see it yet again they wake up and then they follow the path of rebellion again that is very dangerous we are coming to point number three now point number three is the profitable response with great consecration what are we going to do are we going to follow the path of Jonah or are we going to follow the path of the Lord Jesus Christ the path of the just and the path of the justified the people who are awakening we are waking to our faults. We are waking to our carelessness. We are waking to the reality of the situation in our lives. And we say, enough is enough. You cannot run away from God. If you are trying to run away from God, you cannot hide from God. Because he sees everything. He knows everything. He knows the thoughts of the heart. He knows the direction we are going. He knows the thing we have abandoned. He knows the path of duty that we ought to follow. That's why we're ending this message by looking at the profitable response with great consecration. We're dividing this to three parts. Number one, the search for the source of diverse suffering suffering here, suffering there, suffering there. I've become a Christian, I'm a child of God and the, the suffering, I never suffered like this. Even when I was an unbeliever, was the source, the search for the source of diverse suffering. Number two, their supplication and surrender with desperate souls. They were 
desperate. They wanted to find solution. You know, solution will come when we're desperate and we say, have I abandoned something? Am I forgetting something? Am I running away from someone? And what is the cause of this in my life? When we make supplication unto God and then we have the total surrender that a desperate soul will have, solution will come in your life in Jesus' name. Number three, our sacrifice and submissiveness to divine sovereignty. We're looking at number one here. Number one is the search for the source of diverse suffering. We're looking at Jonah chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 7, and this said, everyone to his fellow come. Let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. There are times that God will reveal the truth to even unbelievers. There are times that God will reveal the truth on Abimelech. There are times that God will reveal the truth to those magicians of Egypt. And he told Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. There are times that God will reveal to an unbelieving Nebuchadnezzar. He was seeking what will become of the, of the kingdom after he's gone. And he had that dream and there was a Daniel nearby to reveal the might of God. He's the creator of everyone on earth. And there are times that God will reveal to you if you're going through suffering you can't understand. You're going through situations you cannot understand. Everything is confused and you're saying but why? But why? But why? The search for the source of diverse suffering. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause is this evil upon us? What is thine occupation? Brothers and sisters, fellow ministers, this is the question we should have asked at the beginning. When Jonah came, a stranger, when he said, I have the fear, I will pay. And whatever I did, tell me the fear I will pay. And I want to travel with you to such and such a place. Now, what do you think they asked for? Where is your passport in our days? That time, maybe they didn't have passport. Maybe they didn't have identity, identity card. But we should check up the identity card. It's character, it's lifestyle, it's calling. Where is coming from? What is running away from? from the people that you know they have they go to marriage first sight first love final and no question at all they go into the marriage then they discover something they should have known before they got into the people that get into a particular situation they didn't ask any question you should have asked the question ahead of time. We will save ourselves tons of trouble if we will do that at the beginning. They then they said unto him, tell us, we pray thee, who for whose cause it, this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? They were like almost exhaustive in all the questions they were asking. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, he said unto them, I am an Hebrew. Is that so? I fear the Lord. Is that so? The God of heaven which has made the sea and the dry land. Jonah, I thought you should have known that before you got into that ship. Now you understand. God has made the sea and the land. And if you're on a Away from him on land, he'll catch you. If you run away from him on the sea, he'll catch you. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from 
the presence of the Lord because he had told them, he said, I'm fleeing, I'm running away from the presence of God. Jonah, you're trying to do the undoable. It's impossible. Stop that. Don't try to run away. You cannot hide from God. Let's look at number two here. Number two here, we're looking at their supplication and surrender because of their desperation in their souls. We're looking at chapter one, Jonah chapter one, and we're reading from verse 11. In verse 11, then said they unto him, what shall we do unto thee? that the sea may be calm unto us. Now, we're in trouble because of you. We're suffering because of you. See where we are now and see our lives in danger. What shall we do that the sea may be calm unto us for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Look at the next verse there, verse 12. In verse 12, and he said unto them, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. Jonah, why did you say that? They couldn't you repent him on there? And couldn't you say, okay, you pray for me. Let's pray together. And then tell God, God, I was trying to run away. But I know now that I cannot run far, you'll catch me, you'll get me. Why didn't you say, Lord, I followed the way of foolishness. Now I'm going to be wise and I'm not going to run away from the omnipresent God who is everywhere, who can see me every time in everything. I do. Why didn't he say just, just collapse on his face there and say, Lord, I surrender. The Lord could have, you know, directed those people to take him by sea to the border of Nineveh. But no, he said, I'm still fighting. He had a kicking heart, a rebellious heart, and he wanted to fight it to the finish against the God of heaven. And he should have known that this is impossible. Warn to him that striveth with his maker. So he said, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake, this great tempest is upon you. I know for my sake. This great tempest is upon you. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not. But they could not. Somebody fighting with God, wanting to conquer God, was in their ship, and God will not allow. The creature will not conquer the creator. And if the creature makes up his mind, I've started the path of rebellion and the way of transgression, and I'm going to fight against God to the end, God will not allow the creature to conquer the creator. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Those sailors, understood the sovereignty of God, the finality of God. And he said, thou hast done as he pleased thee. Those pagans, heathens, they knew thou hast done as he pleased thee. Those people, they were not Hebrews. They didn't have the Hebrew scriptures. And yet they knew from the things they saw and from the tempest they experienced, they knew, O oh Lord, thou hast done as he pleased thee. If we understand in our lives whatever is happening, Lord, thou hast done as it pleased thee. It will save us from hypertension. It will save us from sleepless nights. It will save us from unnecessary heart problem. It will save us from heart failure. It is when we say, why is this? Why is this? Why is that? I don't understand this. I don't understand that. And we're in confusion. That's when we have hypertension. But when we know that whatever is happening, we know 
no, thou hast done as it pleased thee. That's what you understood. I pray God will give us understanding. There will be peace in our heart, in our soul, in our mind. And we'll just know that that's what pleases God. And then we key into that and we flow with that. And your life will be peaceful in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three, our sacrifice and submission and submissiveness to the divine to divine sovereignty. Look at chapter one of Jonah. We're looking at verse 15. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. So they took up Jonah, and Jonah had said, I'm a prophet of God. I know what to solve the problem. Even though the solution to the problem will affect me, because once you cast me out, the source of your trouble, and I get into the sea, he didn't know that a great fish will swallow him up. He didn't know that there was a whale God had prepared that will swallow him up. He knew that once he was like that, he was gone, but at least these people, they'll be saved and they'll be spared. And he told them the truth. You know, those people could have kept on praying and some would not come. They could have gone into fasting, dry fasting, seven days, and some would not come. The source of the problem and the source of the storm and the source of their destruction was right there. It was like when God told Abimelech and said, Abimelech, you are a dead man. For that woman, Sarah, in your house now, you want to add to all your wives, it's another man's wife. It's Abraham. Abraham's wife, you are a dead man. What's the solution? I did that in the innocency of my heart. The solution is get her out of your house and let her go back to her husband. And when that happens, you'll be free. If Abimelech kept on praying and fasting, praying and fasting, rolling on the ground and going to the mountain, going to the sea, oh God, let not this happen. It will happen because the only solution is get the source of trouble, the source of the problem, get that source out of the boat, get it out of the ship and get it out of your home and then solution will come. You're into occultism and you know that that is against God. Going to occultism, going to getting all those charms, all those images and putting them there, that corner, that corner, then you continue to have bad dreams and terrible things are happening and things are upside down. What you thought will help your life and help your family and help your ministry is destroying you. What's the solution? That's the, uh, that's the object, their forbidding object. Take that thing out and throw it away and then calm will come. There are things that prayer and fasting alone will not solve. We must see what's the will of God. What's he asking me to do? What's this in my house, in my heart, that I'm holding and embracing there that I need to get rid of? So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. The storm of your life was stop. The storm in your ministry will stop. And then look at verse 16. In verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Look at this, look at this. Jonah didn't want his ministry to convert the Ninevites. That's why he ran away. The people he ran to, he didn't intend this. This wasn't something he wanted. That those pagans, those sailors, those mariners, and those uh, shipmen, that they be converted, they were converted. They were converted. Now they feared the Lord, the God of heaven, exceedingly. And they offered sacrifice unto the Lord, the God of heaven. And they even made vows unto the Lord that we will serve you. Now, but that's why Paul the Apostle said, if I preach the gospel willingly, I have 
a reward. But if unwillingly, like Jonah, Jonah now made them to know the God of the Hebrews, the God of heaven. He made them to know the God who is Lord over land and sea. But that was his, his intention. And his presence there converted those people and they made vows unto the Lord. My question is, if people get converted, without our intention, without our wanting them to be converted, without our voluntarily going out to preach to them, they just get converted accidentally against our intention. Are we going to get a reward for that? The answer is no. Why don't you we willingly say, oh Lord, I know your will, I know your calling, I know the great commission, I know what you are telling me to do, and with my heart, all hearted voluntarily without any coercion and without any force without any storm without having to go through the sea I will obey you and then we lay our lives on the altar of the Lord all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give my heart my soul my skill everything I have I consecrate to the Lord great will be your reward in heaven the people that get converted because you do it with your volition and with your heart and those people now they sacrifice to the Lord, they surrender to the Lord and they're serving the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind because you do that voluntarily your reward here will be wonderful your reward in heaven will be great and when Christ shall come and call his people home you'll be among the saints among the servants of God that will go home for your reward in Jesus name why don't we now stand up and say Lord you'll examine your life are you a Jonah are you carnal are you still sick or are you backsliding are you rebellious have you gone away from the calling of God upon your life are you running from here to here? Are you running from denomination to denomination? Are you running from church to church? Because there is something God is demanding of you and you are not surrendering your life. Why don't you say, Lord, can I hide anymore? Everything now I surrender unto you and the Lord will receive you. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. God is a pardoning God. He will pardon you. He will forgive you. He will turn your life around and he will give you victory on your way. Way, and then you start the ministry afresh with new strength and new vigor and you start with new vision and the ministry the work will prosper in your hand in Jesus name open your mouth now and pray talk to the Lord the ministry 